Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I think one of the things that we are looking to do is make this uh, make this one of the features where uh, students, especially PhD students from our department, take the opportunity to now present their work. Uh, it creates, it's one of those things, going to a conference and presenting, of course, is one aspect of it. But being able to do this now to their fellow peers here in the department could potentially allow for some cross-pollination. Um, so in this context, we thought we'd kick this thing off by uh, talking about the current status of the Open CAV program, as well as uh, some of the newer things that um, that have happened since the last update. So, for those who don't know me, I'm Venkat Krovi, uh, professor in the department, and we have out here the Tinker Twins, Chinmay Samak and Tanmay Samak, and Pardala, and and they will actually walk us through most of the presentation. But what I thought I'd do is present the broader concept and context um, in a quick few slides and then take it from there. So today's uh, presentation, right, I think is going to now cover a range of uh, autonomy deployments that vary in scale. Uh, on the left, you have the one-tenth scale vehicles and uh, the mid-scale vehicles, and then, of course, the full-scale vehicle. And then today's discussions will be on, on either, one, uh, either side, on the scaled, uh, small scale and the full scale. And I wanted to present the context in which sort of we view autonomy, right? So autonomous systems, robotic systems, intelligent systems, you know, people have many conceptions and misconceptions about them. Um, they've been around for 60 plus years. And at their core, what you have are sensors and actuators that are orchestrated by a microcontroller or a microprocessor to then do some of the dull, dumb, dirty, dangerous tasks in the world, to manipulate things in the en environment. So people argue that this is now extending human reach into these dull, dumb, dirty, dangerous spaces. But increasingly, you're finding that it's not just the individual robot capable of doing this, it's groups of robots. So it's the interactions of this robot now with the real world, with the virtual world, with other intelligent robotic systems, and most critically, the human user that now drives some of the value. So in this context, what you're seeing is that there is, over these past 60 years, there's been no shortage of uh, intelligent sensing, intelligent actuation. You've, of course, had new sensing and actuation modalities, but then also embedding sensors, embedding computation close to the source allows you to create these intelligent sensors or intelligent actuators, as the case may be. You've not also had a shortage of connectivity, right? So you have... Uh, you know, it started out with wired connections, then it went to wireless connections, uh, LTE, uh, Wi-Fi, what have you. But it's really how these get specialized to people and processes where we see the biggest challenges. And so uh, if you were to like take a perspective of these past 60 years, you'll see that, you know, there've been a number of application verticals. You've got the home, you've got transportation, you've got healthcare, a number of these verticals. And in many cases, some robotics have, have, has made progress in one vertical more than others. And now you have this unique opportunity to look for these cross pollination. So the question is, can um, SLAM maps that were, let's say, really popularized in self-driving cars, be relevant on the manufacturing shop floor or vice versa. Um, so in this context, I wanted to talk about connected autonomy systems. And then we've, I've mentioned this in the past uh, too, but I'll keep it brief today. We're looking at 
two paradigms merging. One is this idea of sense, think, and act, the so-called autonomy paradigm, with the distributed network systems paradigm. And so at face value, right, you could say, oh, this is not new. Because if you, if you think about a car today, this idea of having ECUs connected by a CAN bus has existed for quite a while now. But the scope of operations has been growing. And so as you come to, as you extend beyond the car to now a vehicle level automation and, and looking at exteroceptive sensors, all of a sudden the amount of data and, and your region of influence has started to grow. And then as you start to bring in uh, information and resources now from smart, uh, from let's say over the air through different uh, connectivity modalities, that sphere of influence has also grown. So when you've talked about, when you've talked about autonomy, um, it started out with sensors like radars, Right? And this has been there since the mid 80s. But as you've started to add more and more uh, sensing, cameras, LIDARs, the amount of data that you're processing has started to grow. So if you said, this is now digital insight into this analog world, this idea of being able to now create one-off examples exists. But how do you then create uh, a system, a framework for verification and validation and to get the 99.9999% uh, verification capability, that becomes a challenge. It becomes a challenge because of the following reasons. What you're seeing here on the left-hand side is that, you know, you've probably seen this picture like this before. A car today is a software-defined vehicle. Even in back in 2009, you had 100 million lines of code for a car. I just wanted to throw that out because, you know, it rolls off the tongue very easily. But being able to manage that class of code takes new capabilities. On the other hand, you're also working with an automotive uh, ecosystem where there is significant amount of legacy products. So you have perhaps uh, anti-lock braking systems developed in the 80s. You have other systems, vehicle stability systems developed in the 90s. And now you have new modern systems based on deep learning perhaps. And so this idea of being able to blend all of this is where the uh, challenges and opportunities come. So here at Clemson, we look at a number of these vehicles across different scales. You have the small scale vehicles where, which we use for in class projects. You have the independent study uh, done on mid scale. And of course you have the full scale. So Dr. Gia's uh, CRA lab does some work with, with the uh, Nissan Leaf. And there is the OEM fully integrated open CAV that we'll talk about. One of the things that I wanted to highlight is that it is the size of the code base that is important in, in, in dealing with many of these. Oftentimes, right, uh, the scale also does matter, scale, physical scale of the vehicle also does matter. But fortunately, there, are ability, there is an ability to now take code that has been verified at, at a smaller, on a smaller scale vehicle and be able to transition it relatively easily to full-scale vehicles. Um, and this is not new to the automotive industry. Aircraft design, um, there are a number of other places where people have done similar things using dynamic similitude and other capability. So here we've talked about this idea of how do we create a set of courses that now support this growth, this growing uh, cyber physical design evaluation testing. And I, what you're seeing is an, a number of courses. Uh, there's my autonomy course, there's Dr. Gia's automotive electronics course, there's Dr. Lee's autonomous perception course and the autonomous driving course. But these are just a handful of courses we offer. They're complemented by courses on main campus 
that now allow people to to start to wet their feet and gain gain some greater insight into what it would take to deploy these systems because ultimately in many of these cases we are supported by the use of these middleware tools whether it's ros whether it's the nvidia suite of tools um, mathworks suite of tools they allow us to access this at at the early stage but also to be able to take this through to the uh, uh, production scale and so in the examples that the students will show you'll see how some of these frameworks end up being used to help support this transition so the opportunities of course are quite diverse and you have opportunities in in many different areas that we are pursuing uh, and and today i think the students are going to give us a little bit of a flavor of some of these so parda So thank you, Dr. Krovi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So here we'll be talking about the different scaled uh, vehicle deployments as a part of the ARM lab. So here, so as a as an automotive engineer, you can think, okay, why are we not deploying everything on a full scale vehicle? The th challenge is that it's it's complex, and they're also limiting because of the safety and reliability of the algorithms deployed. Deployed. So these scaled vehicles can act as a surrogate vehicles for a uh, your algorithm testing. And uh, this enables us to test these algorithms reliably and safely. And you can deploy these on your full scale vehicles. Uh, they also help in rapid prototyping of these algorithms through a easy real to sim to real deployments. And as you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the real vehicle testing is challenging. So what we try to do is before deploying it on a real way, uh, real vehicles, we try to deploy these in a high fidelity simulation environment, which captures a realistic uh, uh, environmental interactions. And from there, we can go and deploy these on uh, real vehicles. So here, first I'll be talking on a small scale uh, vehicle deployments, and then I'll give a small overview on mid scale vehicle, uh, and also the full scale vehicle deployments. So some of the vehicle platform that we use as a part for the autonomy deployments are the F110 vehicles with its own, with it, uh, with the NVIDIA chip chipsets deployed on it, and a uh, onboard uh, sensing uh, suite uh, such as uh, cameras or a GNSS system, uh, and a concerts queue car, NVIDIA's uh, 110 platform, and AWS Depressor and uh, Auto Drive's Nigel platform. And these are some of the way small scale vehicle platform that we use to test our algorithms. And coming to some of the work that we did using these uh, vehicle. Uh, vehicle platforms, you can think of as an end-to-end uh, end -end learning process that we deploy. You can ask, why are you deploying these on a small-scale vehicles first than instead of on a real vehicles? Because they are, these, uh, these algorithms are still in the developmental phase than in our de uh, deployment phase. What it does is it allows you to uh, it allows you to do the tests in a more holistic way in the sense uh, I'm not saying they, these small scale vehicles are like uh, expendable or something. What uh, you can, uh, with the real vehicles, it becomes uh, slightly challenging in the considering of a safety or a reliability. If, if, it, if something happens and if it hits uh, something, it's, it hits someone, it becomes dangerous. Whereas the small scale vehicles, it becomes easy for you also to change the sensors if there is a faulty sensor or uh, any other issue with your algorithm. So here in this, uh, end-to-end -end, uh, learning framework, what we have is uh, six steps. The first step is real-to-sim uh, system where uh, you're trying to capture the entire realistic uh, environmental interactions in a simulated environment. Once you have this simulated environment, what you try to do is you want to set up a physics-aware uh, setting which maps the environmental interactions with this agent. So here the RL uh, pipeline acts the environment with the acts as a connector between the environment and uh, uh, the agent. This acts like a glue between uh, these two systems. You can think of once we tune, uh, once we finished our tune, uh, tuning and we learned the optimized parameters and the policy, we should be able to see this in a sim to first a simulation environment and then deploy this on a real vehicle uh, platform. So some of the examples of this will be seen in the uh, 
uh, next slide. So here, uh, some of the data-driven end-to-end learning process that we work uh, uh, with some of the students were in the form of either imitation learning and also a reinforcement learning based approach. Uh, in the imitation learn based approach, what you're trying to do is you, are, you have a desired trajectory and you're trying to uh, uh, learn to optimize the policy to follow the desired trajectory. Here you can see like uh, some of the students were able to do this testing uh, uh, during the COVID era. Like, uh, so because one of the advantage of that was there are no no pedestrians or cars, anything on the road. They were able to test these, uh, their algorithms on the roads around the CMI or the CUI car. And one of the test deployment, as you can see here, was they made a Melbourne's uh, F1 track and they were able to uh, test the, learn uh, the obstacle avoidance or a lane keeping through the imitation learning approach. And they were able to do this here. On the other side, uh, you have two different uh, reinforcement uh, learning based approaches that implemented. One is for uh, race line optimization. You're trying to see how fast, uh, what is the best policy for uh, the vehicle so that it can go uh, quicker. That is, you can see in the leftmost one. And the other one, what you're trying to do is uh, you have a preview of the, so the concert cue car, it, it is equipped with the LIDAR and also the camera sensor. And with the camera sensor, it's able to get a preview of what's happening ahead of it. And using this as a preview, and what it's telling, uh, what the reinforcement learning agent does is, it tries to provide a, a output, which will uh, uh, minimize the vertical accelerations and also provide a, a longitudinal velocity for the vehicle to traverse. So now moving on to the mid-scale vehicle platforms, now we talked about the small scale vehicles, which will become like a, a base for these uh, deployments of our reinforcement learning uh, frameworks and all. Now, mid-scale vehicle platform, they come in a proper, uh, like a really nice sweet spot, sweet spot between the small scale vehicle and also the uh, full scale vehicles. Here you can try to test your algorithms uh, in a more uh, similar to what you do in a, a full scale vehicles. So some of the platform that we use in our mid-scale deployments are the uh, Husky's skid steered vehicle platform and also the Hunter, which is, uh, kept, which is an Ackerman steered vehicle. So uh, going through the process overflow of this uh, deployment, as you can see, the very first step we try to do is we, trap, we try to map out the environment in which we want to uh, navigate. And we try to localize, as you can see on the very first thing. And the next one is, how do you want to go from a point A to point B. You have like a, within the planning, you have like a two uh, subsection you can think of, the global planner and a local planner. The global planner is like a optimization of like a, uh, what is the best pathway for you to go from a point A to point B? Uh, and moving on to the local planner is like, how do you execute this, uh, uh, the optimized path? Like uh, in terms of like, a, how do I provide an, uh, op like a really good uh, throttle input or a steering input based on the uh, interaction surrounding the vehicle itself. Uh, and on the navigation part is executing these local planner and the global planners uh, algorithm. And teleoperation, you can think of it as like, a, what do you do when, uh, when, this algo when the vehicle which is running the particular algorithm encounters a uh, edge case scenario? How do you bring it out of its uh, uh, difficult situation where it cannot decide between what to do. Like you can use the teleoperation as a secondary uh, uh, framework, like emergency situation where you try to bring it, where you manually drive the vehicle sitting from a control framework or a hub uh, away from the vehicle and try to bring it, bring out of the difficult situation and let the autonomy framework take over from there. So you'd see a similar thing with the, so right now this one is with a Hunter platform. And uh, in the next slide, you can see this with the, uh, more of a Husky platform, which is a skid steered vehicle. And now next moving on to the uh, main feature of this presentation, which is the full scale vehicle, the open CAV vehicle, the open connected and automated vehicle platform. So why we do this? Like uh, you can think of uh, it as uh, autonomy testing is really hard in terms of scaling as Dr. Tobi mentioned earlier, the scale of your uh, testing really matters because uh, even when you're trying to test uh, your algorithm on, on for a small scale vehicles between a sim simulation environment and a real, uh, real vehicle environment, it takes a lot more tuning for the students who are doing these in their uh, courses. So imagine the same thing you're trying to do with the full scale vehicle, which is equipped with the array of uh, different sensors and it's 
sending out a data in a huge amount and uh, and these autonomous vehicles need to process these information at a very quick rate such that it becomes really challenging. So what we had is like what we thought were, what was needed was we needed a high fidelity uh, multimodal equipment for our research and also it paves a way for uh, multi-research collaboration between different CAE sub CAV subgroups. So the open, CAV, uh, the open CAV group, what the aim of this group was to develop a novel modular open architecture, open platform, and open source software-based research instrument. As you can see here, uh, 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 so the open CAV vehicle and it's a digital twin are in a are ensconced in their own respective layers of, uh, as you can see here, the hardware, the physical vehicle has its own, the bywear control, the in-vehicle in storage system, and its own uh, sensor suite and a compute system so that it can generate the uh, trajectories and everything for the algorithm to go. Whereas on the simulation side, you have uh, uh, for a vehicle simulation, and we have the car, car sim or a D-space system or a, uh, D space system to simulate a vehicle environment. And for the drive aware controls, you have the uh, Mavic systems so that they can provide control uh, uh, objectives. And we also can use the compute clusters and uh, also these things uh, in conjunction with each other. So as you can see here, you can all, you can say like, why are you using the simulation? Uh, why not di directly deploy it on a real vehicle? So it, one of the research published earlier, it was said that uh, for a, uh, for any one particular algorithm to safely uh, test, it was expected that uh, nearly 100 uh, fleet of 100 autonomous vehicles need to be run 365, uh, 365 days a year, 24 hours 7, to make sure you reach the level of uh, human capability. Like a, uh, so that's why you want to do first, you want to create the digital twin of the environment or the uh, environment in which you want to travel and you test your algorithm for uh, different variables in, different scenarios and then try to implement first in this simulated environment setting and then move on to the real world setting. And uh, moving on to some of the work done uh, with the help of these uh, uh, OpenCV architecture was using uh, Metamoto, which is, which is a cloud-based simulation environment and you're trying to do a, uh, in a simulation as a service paradigm, what we try to do is, uh, so here you have a Metamoto, which is a, cloud simulation engine, which provides you the uh, digital twin of the way, a digital twin of your vehicle, the environment in which you want to traverse. And what it does is it has a, a it uses a Docker-based uh, system under the system under test uh, interaction between your MATLAB Simulink or the using the ROS-based framework in the middle uh, to send the commands between your, uh, the controller to the uh, vehicle for it to carry out this uh, navigation in this simulation environment. Uh, as you can see in the workflow here, you try to first la launch the Docker container, which consists of your own, all the, uh, the different versions of the software that you need for your deployment. And then uh, you create your ROS messages to, uh, in, a, the ma in the manner. So you initialize the MATLAB nodes and everything. So what it does is it, uh, it lets you do a variability testing for different uh, uh, either uh, different sensor conditions, different weather conditions. It tests, it allows you to uh, run like a, in a parallel compute setting of your algorithm for a variable uh, environmental conditions as well as uh, different uh, scenario settings. Uh, as you can see here, uh, one of the uh, research that was published in the SAE WCX was they, the students were able to create a, a autonomous emergency braking scenario in the Metamoto. And as you can see in the top one, they were they uh, they deployed this uh, algorithm uh, behind uh, uh, behind a stopped vehicle in a car, and the other uh, deployment was when the vehicle encounters a pedestrian who is walking on the road to see if the uh, algorithm is working fine or not. They were able to do that, and uh, so. Researchers at Clemson University's OpenCAB group are creating a novel modular, open architecture, open interface, and open source software-based research instrument for software in the loop and hardware in the loop design, validation, and verification. Clemson partnered with Metamoto because their robust enterprise architecture gave them the scale they required. 
The use of virtual GPUs promised to lower the cost of hardware by reducing the number of GPUs while ensuring that the same level of service was still available. Testing and validating autonomous system software in the real world is important. However, the sheer volume of testing required to make safe autonomous system software requires simulation. There are many variables, including weather conditions, time of day, traffic conditions, and pedestrian behavior. To test all possible permutations of these, even in simulation, requires substantial compute resources. There is a challenge of GPU utilization in high-performance computing. Some jobs rarely use the requested GPU resources, and some jobs only utilize a fraction of GPU capacity. Maximizing GPU utilization has a real impact on HPC operation, and NVIDIA virtualization technology combined with Metamoto's scalable architecture allowed researchers to solve this problem. Metamoto's advanced service-based simulation system was designed to take advantage of modern design patterns, including containerized workloads orchestrated by Kubernetes and GPUs to accelerate simulation and rendering. Clemson researchers were able to quickly obtain the scale they needed to carry out their research on a distributed simulation system. Dr. Venkat Krovi's Open Connected and Automated Vehicle Group is developing novel modular, open architecture, open interface, and open source software-based research instruments comprised of augmented reality-based simulation to facilitate hardware. So now moving on to this, like a, uh, that presentation was done in the NVIDIA GTC because they liked the work that we did with the Metamoto and everything it was present in NVIDIA's GTC conference in 2020, I guess. And now moving on to the open CAV system architecture, as you can see here, uh, you can see how the real vehicle is interacting and how the how you set up the simulation uh, in the digital twin and in a simulation environment. As you can see, on the real world side, you have uh, the vehicle which is equipped with uh, uh, array of sensors such as uh, cameras, radar, LIDAR, and a GNSC system. And it also has a Xeon class compute to uh, process all the uh, all the data that is being collected and send out a requisite uh, control commands for the safe uh, algorithm deployment. And for the bywire controls, you have uh, new eagles uh, dry bywire controls. And here we have a, a ROS enabled autoware system is acting as a acting as a middleware for a interaction between different modules for a sensing perception or the perception planning uh, navigation stacks. Uh, and on the simulation side, uh, to recreate the real vehicle in a simulated environment, you can use uh, different vehicle simulators such as uh, a car sim, D space, and all. And for the driver controls, you have the Mavic system and everything here. And now, moving on to the software. Uh, software framework here you can think of a the driver control we have is a new eagles and it allows for the uh, communication exchange between all the sensors uh, and also it has a uh, access to the states of your control uh, states of your vehicle and also the information about different uh, sensors and everything so it should be able to publish the data seamlessly between uh, different nodes that are required and now moving on to the open cv or open cav is a full-scale autonomous vehicle housed at the Clemson University International Center for Automotive Research. The vehicle itself is a 2018 Chrysler Pacifica retrofitted with a modular sensor suite, comprising of a standalone dual antenna GNSS and MUMS grade inertial measurement unit, two HD cameras of different focal length, an electronically scanning radar and a 32-beam 3D LiDAR. The vehicle employs a rugged GPU computing edge AI platform for onboard computation, and hosts a 23 terabytes onboard data storage equipment. It is connected to the outer world through a dedicated cradle point network. All the vehicle data is accessible over CAN bus connected to the ECU, which can be used for developing, testing and debugging autonomy algorithms. Lastly, the vehicle hosts a drive-by-wire system capable of controlling the steering, throttle, brakes, and gear shift, along with auxiliary components such as lights, doors, and wipers. The autonomy stack of OpenCAV is developed on top of Autoware.ai which runs on Ubuntu 18.04, with ROS Melodic as a middleware framework. This facilitates continuous development and integration of autonomy modules such as mapping, perception, localization, motion planning, and control. Now that we have an overview of hardware and software architecture of OpenCAV, it's time to see the vehicle in action. Here, 
we demonstrate an autonomous shuttle ride from AVX Lab to Carola Campbell Jr. Graduate Engineering Center at CUI CAR. The autonomy algorithm demonstrated here works in three stages. First, as depicted earlier, the environment is mapped using the LiDAR point cloud data by driving the vehicle manually. Next, a reference trajectory is generated by manually driving the vehicle within the mapped environment, while recording the waypoints with respect to the map's coordinate frame. Finally, in autonomous mode, the vehicle tracks the reference trajectory using Stanley controller for lateral motion control, and PID controller for longitudinal motion control. This final stage of hands-free autonomous operation of the vehicle is demonstrated in current segment of the video. Uh, now I'll hand over to the Tanmay and Chinmay to present the work on the, what they did with the auto drive simulator and the open semi vehicle. Uh, thanks, Pada. Uh, so we will be showing or demonstrating our efforts to create autonomy-oriented digital twins. Autonomy-oriented digital twins uh, using the AutoDrive ecosystem. So just to give a quick overview of what the system is, is we have basically three components. We have a hardware test bed, we have a software simulation to act as a digital twin environment, and then we have DevKit, which can be thought of as a software framework to develop your autonomy algorithms and interface either with the test bed or with the simulation. So the idea here is to uh, also now, since we have the OpenCV project, uh, try to bring the two systems or the two ecosystems together to have one common tool chain or workflow that we can use to you know, develop, debug, and test our autonomous algorithms on. So just to give a quick uh, overview of what this uh, ecosystem is really capable of, uh, we have scaled as well as full-scale vehicle uh, support. Uh, we can do things like uh, conventional perception uh, planning control kind of modular autonomy algorithms. We can use uh, imitation or reinforcement learning frameworks, or we can even use uh, connectivity to now uh, develop and deploy uh, connected autonomous vehicle applications. What you can see on the in the first video is a modular uh, perception planning control uh, kind of framework that is being deployed. On the second one, you can see imitation learning to uh, perform behavioral cloning application. In the third, you can see uh, intersection traversal uh, in a multi-vehicle uh, environment using deep reinforcement learning. So right now in the video, you can just see one environment, but what was really happening during, during the training phase was that we had spawned multiple environments and there were multiple agents learning at the same time to uh, optimize the, like, the time required for training. And the final video that uh, shows the uh, connected autonomy application wherein the vehicle it itself is completely blind just to over exaggerate the point but what is essentially happening is there is a smart city management server that is uh, recording where the ve uh, vehicle is what is the current state of the environment around it and commanding the vehicle to perform the navigation in a end to end framework so as i was mentioning we have a small scale vehicles as well as full scale vehicles that can be used uh, within the ecosystem and we have real as well as virtual uh, counterparts of the same so that we can perform uh, testing at a scale rather than just uh, being very cautious in the hardware or being just too uh, unrealistic in simulation. And now I would hand it to Tanmay to discuss more in depth about what is going in the back uh, of this efforts. Thank you. So first thing that you all may, uh, like noticed is the visual rendering of the simulation. So for that, we are using different materials and textures uh, in the background. Uh, so we are using Unity's high definition render pipeline and high definition uh, materials, which allow uh, surface rendering for opaque as well as transparent materials. And we have also uh, support for like adding textures and decals to the uh, objects that are there in the simulation environment. So as an example, you saw the open CAV with the uh, tiger print that was using the decals and which which basically simulates the uv mapping of all the textures onto the pro projected objects in terms of material properties we have different material properties that can be simulated so you have standard materials which can be simulated just for the metallicness or the smoothness of the surface you have uh, subsurface scattering which basically simulates the light interaction and penetration through thin objects uh, such as uh, like translucent she sheets of paper or something like that 
Then you have anisotropy, which basically is the characteristic of a material to change its properties based on the orientation that it's being viewed from. You have iridescence effect, which uh, basically is a rainbow kind of effect when you have a really polished glass and you view it from an oblique angle. You have specular color and specular reflections, which is uh, like the light beam is not scattering while it's reflecting, it's reflecting as, a, as it would on a plane uh, mirror. You have translucent objects, which is uh, nothing but thickness aware uh, subsurface scattering. So it, uh, it, it can be used to simulate uh, light penetration through thin leaves of a tree, which basically uh, like have a slight glow when uh, sunlight penetrates to them. And finally, you have emissive materials, which can be used to uh, simulate uh, rendering displays or like low light intensity objects. Uh, now, next, coming to the lights. Uh, so, I'll be giving an example of the open CAV vehicle. So, we have emissive materials, as I talked about, for the instrumentation cluster inside the vehicle. And the light uh, bulbs themselves have emissive material to uh, differentiate between a light turned off and uh, turned on. Uh, next, we use ray casting for uh, simulating the light projections within the simulator for uh, spotlights, which can be in the case of a tail light or indicator of the vehicle and focus lights in case of the headlights or fog lamps or things like that. Apart from this, we are using post-processing uh, effects to uh, take into account things like ambient occlusion and contact shadows. So for example, you can see that when the vehicle is actually uh, touching the ground, there is a higher shadow uh, as, uh, as it happens in the real world. You have auto exposure and bloom effects to enhance the uh, rendering capabilities. So, Whenever a light is turned on, it will tend to have a blooming effect on the camera lens. That is what is, uh, this, this is uh, being simulated. And the camera will, uh, will adjust its, auto, its exposure automatically based on the light intensity that is coming through. Next, we have also a uh, uh, capability of simulation, the, uh, simulating the lens distortion and the depth of field of the camera that is viewing the uh, scene, as well as the cameras on board the vehicle. And uh, then we have colored grading and tone mapping to uh, you know, match the coloring and the environment toning based on how the real world is, instead of just a uh, single, uh, single pass uh, light rendering. Finally, we have chromatic aberration motion blur effects to simulate the slight, uh, slight uh, imperfections that are there due to the camera uh, captures. And we have finally the screen space reflections, which basically uh, uh, perform live reflection calculations while the for the scene that is only being rendered in the camera frame. Next, coming to the vehicle light and indicators, as you can see in the demo videos, right uh, towards the right of the presentation, we have uh, functionalities to simulate the headlights in off condition, low beam as well as high beam, uh, including a capacitive delay. So, if you see this video, when the headlight turns off, you will see a slight delay uh, as compared to uh, like switching off uh, in uh, in real time and then you have tail lights which can be simulated in off uh, dim when the brakes are applied and fully bright when sorry dim when the headlights are turned on and fully bright when the brakes are applied you have turning indicators for left right and hazard uh, indication you have reverse indicators which are automatically simulated based on the throttle input that's being given to the vehicle uh, brake indicator which is the lamp on the top of the rear of the vehicle and then the fog lights uh, that you saw in the video so uh, next, we'll be talking about the vehicle dynamics that's being simulated. So first, let's talk about the kinematics and dynamics of the vehicle itself. So you have different parameters and uh, that can be adjusted in real time while the simulation is happening or offline and then start the simulation. So you can adjust the center of mass and mass distribution of the vehicle. Uh, you can adjust the air drag that can be applied to the vehicle. And you can also set it to be a variable profile rather than a constant uh, so you can like simulate air drag based on the velocity or the direction in which the vehicle is oriented. Uh, you can do collision detection and interpolation between two uh, time steps of the collision detection to simulate things like, uh, for example, in this video, you can see the vehicle crashing into the uh, obstacles that are placed to mimic buildings. So those kind of things can be possible and like realistically simulated using collision detections. The Ackerman steering mechanism is uh, demoed here, where you can see the vehicle wheels clearly turning in different uh, angles based on the Ackerman uh, geometry. And finally, uh, you can simulate the oversteer or understeer performance of the vehicle as well. Coming to the suspension dynamics, uh, we use the spring mass representation of the vehicle, a full car, full car model to uh, simulate the uh, su uh, suspension system, 
wherein you can tune the travel uh, natural frequency damping ratio and force shift of the suspensions for each individual suspension as well and we are also simulating anti roll bars which are like basically can be added as modules to the front rear or anywhere you would like uh, to uh, to simulate the anti, uh, like anti roll capability for the vehicle depending on how it's manufactured in terms of powertrain uh, dynamics we have uh, different drive types so for front wheel drive rear wheel drive as well as all wheel drive for the vehicle and you can ha uh, you can tune the uh, like uh, engine or motor torque curves based on how the like the vehicle is is it a ic engine is it a hybrid uh, or is it a ev and uh, you can tune the uh, like torque curves for the uh, engine or the uh, the motor that's controlling it uh, along with the audio that is being played in real time so this audio can be really an uh, interesting way in autonomy where you have uh, speak uh, like microphones as the sensors to detect uh, different faults in the system uh, we have also simulation uh, modules for transmission and the gear ratios as you can see here so you can tune the profile of how the gear shifts change the uh, torque ratios and finally the differential split and torque drop at the uh, differential in terms of actuator dynamics uh, we have uh, approximated uh, behavior of act actuators instead of a simple linear behavior so that we can simulate uh, some uh, things like uh, the dead band or the hysteresis if uh, if if we want so we have uh, currently for the open cav we have the throttle brake handbrake steering as the low level actuators for the system and in the video here down you can see the demonstration of the combination brakes versus the handbrakes you can clearly see that all the four wheels if we apply brakes how the vehicle is performing versus a handbrake only uh, like locks the rear wheels how that is performing uh, and as i said we can like model the uh, response delay dead band and saturation limits of these actu uh, actuators and finally coming to the tire dynamics we are using a model that uh, can be uh, graphically represented something like this wherein we have a slip on the x axis and the force value on the y axis and we have a two a two piece spline that fits uh, the two uh, parameters given the extremum uh, point and the asymptote point on the curve to mimic the tire forces uh, another key thing to note here is that we can model the stiffness and the friction coefficient of the ground and the tire interaction and we can also uh, simulate the visual effects of the tires screeching so i'm not sure if you can see in this video but there are skid trail marks being left behind the vehicle and the smoke that's being emitted because of the tires screeching when the brakes are applied uh, along with the audio that you hear so now i'll give it to chinmay to talk about the autonomy aspects of the digital twin thank you tanmay so uh, what we can use as a sensor suite in the simulation is fundamentally the telemetry information that can capture things like the time or the frame rate that is currently available for you uh, we can also have the driving mode so is it uh, in autonomous mode or is it like a manually tele operated vehicle we can have the current gear shift Uh, the current velocity the wheel odometry measurements the throttle brake and uh, handbrake steering feedbacks in real time we are also simulating uh, gnss with realistic uncertainty which will uh, project the uncertainty over the current rigid body transform of the vehicle uh, and the current uh, frame of reference is the rear axle as in the real vehicle we are also simulating imu to give uh, orientation uh, in terms of euler angle or cartesian representations uh, angular velocities and linear acceleration so we also have access to the raw data as well as the process stage rs values uh, we are also simulating the cameras both the cameras that you can see uh, on the right hud heads up display to uh, realistically simulate the focal length the sensor size and then we are applying the post processing effects as tanmay mentioned to enhance the rendering uh, as it happens in the real world uh, we also are using uh, modeling the 3d lidar which can be gpu accelerated if you have a gpu but if you don't have access to a powerful gpu you can also offer, uh, use the uh, existing cpu architecture to perform the uh, live ray casting so let's now talk about some of the extended features that we can leverage things like first person view so we have detailed interior uh, model of the vehicle and with realistic materials and mirrors so this can be used for uh, things like uh, first person experience or uh, driver training or things like that or driver experience kind of tests uh we also have the real, realistic animated steering wheel uh, with the real, uh, real uh, steering ratio of the actual vehicle and live instrument cluster displaying the speed or the gear shift or uh, similar properties of the vehicle in real time 
we have a single click uh, data recording functionality wherein you can see, uh, record time synchronized data at uh, whatever preset frame rate or uh, uh, frequency you want and it will record all of the data like uh, vehicle state sensor information uh, actuator commands and all of that in real time for you and then uh, you can access this data easily uh, using comma separated value files and the image files that are stored where the paths are recorded in the csv file we uh, in terms of uh, backend scripting we have the nati native native c sharp scripting that comes with unity and uh, we are also giving plugins or uh, apis to different uh, frameworks we have we uh, using this backend scripting what you can do is update the uh, dynamics or graphics behavior or uh, performance of the simulator the way you want for a particular application you can also add functions and features like for example you don't uh, you can turn off the data recording if you are uh, if you don't really need it or you can add something more else that you really desire for a particular application uh, in terms of the api support we currently have interfaces for a uh, very famous uh, robot operating system and python and c++ and we are also working on uh, developing api support for matlab ros2 and autoware so now i will give it to, to tanmay to discuss more about the time and weather simulation and how we can perform variability analysis using this ecosystem okay so here we can uh, we now talked about the vehicle simulation now let's come to the environment simulation so you can vary the time of the day based on uh, how like uh, how the sun is located and light intensity as well so we are using a physically based sky and sun to procedurally generate the lighting effects the light intensity and direction will vary according to the time of the day and we are also using diffuse lighting to simulate the uh, slight light that is left over even if the sun sets or just before the sun has already risen so for example in this video you can see now the time is being uh, time lapsed in the simulation to show the variation in the light intensities across different uh, uh, times of the day and at night you have you can either have a pitch black night which is being simulated here or you can add a moon and add moonlight based on your requirements uh, next we can uh, talk about the simulation of weather conditions so uh, for this video uh, you can the top two rows are simulating the different times of the day so for example here we have uh, just a uh, time of the day when the sun is about to rise so you can see the uh, horizon lighting uh, that is uh, being procedurally generated and in also in the case of the sun setting uh, time and uh, throughout the day you can like notice the different angles that the uh, like light, shadows are being cast or like the light intensity as well uh, next we can simulate also procedurally generated weather effects so that bottom two rows uh, uh, showcase that if, uh, uh, feature so we can simulate the clouds both static as well as dynamic so uh, a feature of auto drive simulator is that uh, we understand that not everyone has access to high performance computing resources and you should be also able to run this simulator locally on a single laptop so we have different graphics and uh, different graphics qualities where you can uh, selectively enable uh, low rendering quality or high rendering quality depending on your uh, your compute availability and even for that matter you can simulate settings like for example here we have shown since we recorded these videos on our laptop we uh, we did this in a serial uh, fashion but if you have access to hpc resources you can now parallelize all of these environments simultaneously and simulate different variations across the scene and the vehicle conditions next uh, so uh, so so talking about the cloud simulation we have uh, a clear day that is a sunny day and here you can see an overcast uh, cloudy day next we talk about volumetric fog generation and mist generation so the two videos here you can see a low a low density fog and a high density fog being simulated and this is being simulated uh, volumetrically not just being post processed on top of the screen so all the lighting effects that you see here for example the traffic lights uh, or even the headlights of the vehicle will capture uh, the diffusion of the light that will happen due to the fog or mist present in the environment uh, next we talk about the precipitation effects so here you have uh, two examples of rain being simulated one is light rain or drizzle and then there is a heavy rain you can also set the cloud uh, thickness and like uh, based on the amount of rain that is happening in the environment so here you can see that the cloud uh, clouds are dense but they are not as dense compared to the heavy rain uh, condition uh, finally we have uh, snow uh, being simulated here i am not sure whether you guys can see the snowflakes dropping from the sky but uh, if you look close in the like uh, light region of the vehicle uh, where the headlights are being projected you can see uh, the snowflakes falling 
another thing to note here is the mist being simulated due to the uh, weather condition so you can see the diffusion of the headlights of the vehicle if we do the same in the fog condition it, it is just too bright and that's why it's advised not to use your uh, high beam lights when there is a fog and you is use your fog lights instead uh, finally we also simulate wind effects in these precipitation uh, or all the weather conditions where you can selectively randomize the particles that are uh, precipitating from the sky so for example you can uh, even check like uh, tune the density of the particles so for example rain doesn't affect as, is, isn't affect as, affected as much due to the wind it will just change the direction but for example the snowflakes will really randomly fall uh, from the sky because of their uh, density and finally uh, you can simulate a combination of all of these so these were just a few example cases these are not uh, the only weathers that you can simulate you can come up with interesting uh, uh, combinations of uh, say for example what will happen if uh, there is rain at night or uh, what will happen if there is a, a fog at uh, say 6 pm in the evening or something like that and with that we come to the end of today's presentation and discussion about our efforts past as well as ongoing